three, two, one. From Rapid City, South Dakota, and the Hard Rocker Podcast Network, focusing on stories on and off the playing surface. This is the Hard Rocker Huddle. My name is Josh Van Valkenberg Gernert. This is the 35th episode of the Hard Rocker Huddle. Today, our guest is. Hard Rocker football player Dante Robbins. How are you doing today, Dante? I'm doing very well. I'm very well. How are you? Good. Um, just first, let's just start talking about, I guess, the season so far. Um, obviously, you know, this weekend was a tough one. But overall, I mean, obviously there's been a lot of growth from this season compared to last season. Um, and obviously there's a lot of opportunity left. You know, you guys could still really do some damage just looking at your schedule. So what do you kind of have to do, you know, to kind of forget about the BH game and move forward? So obviously this is a big loss losing to BH this week. Wish it wouldn't have happened that way, but what's done is done. I think the whole team is in that mindset of it's already happened, it's in the past, we need to go on to the next game, which is just as big, playing Western Colorado. And I think the biggest change that we've seen from this season to last season is just the overall mentality of our team. Last year, it was kind of just going through the motion of here's practice, here we go. Just keep making it through, make it to the end of the season. And then at the end of the year last year, a lot of us got together and we started talking about what can we do in this off season to make sure that we're better prepared. And we attacked spring ball with a new type of an aggression. And then over the summer, we would meet two to three times a week over Zoom with everyone from our position group. And then as an offense, we would meet twice a week watching film and just getting to know each other better so that we could help motivate each other better. And that's really been the kind of drive that we've seen carry on from the summer into the season that really helped propel us to this next level that we're at, where now it's we're not hitting against Pueblo and Colorado Mines and getting that shock of, oh, wow, we're playing a really good team. Now it's they should be scared that they're playing us. And it's a new type of aggression. I think we're going to see that this next week against Western. Yeah, and you really do see that chemistry out on the field, whether it's the old line. You, you just seem like you're together. There's more chemistry maybe than there has been in the past. And even, like, the QBs to the wider side, obviously Jaden and Jeremiah and Isaiah obviously have a ton of chemistry. What has it been like to just see that grow over the last couple of years? To me, it's been a pleasure. It just makes me smile every time I think about it, where as far as the offensive line goes, when you first get into college football and it's your first day in, you're in fall camp, everything comes as a shock. It's, okay, this is this play. You're learning the entire playbook. You're supposed to have it down in three weeks. You need to be studying very hard to make sure that you just understand the play so that way you can play at 100%. And when I first got here, obviously there was COVID and a lot of other things that were slowing it down. And when I eventually made my transition to offensive line, I would talk to some of the guys and they would be, I think it's this, I think it's that. And as you can see with two freshmen are currently starting on our offensive line at the moment. And there's Kevin Bruxvort and Jackson McCollum. Both of those guys have been able to go out there and play right away. And I think that's due to the meetings that we had over the summer where we were teaching them the plays from back in May that type of area so now they've had three months to learn these plays get an understanding of what the play is supposed to look like and now they could go out there and execute at a high level and the older guys on the team have the confidence in these younger guys to come out and execute because of the time that we spent over the summer working on it and that's also been seen through our QBs with obviously JB, Zay both of those guys have been absolutely competitive in everything they do they attack the day they attack the play and JB has done an ex excellent job of taking the helm of that. And every day after practice, he runs the wide receivers through catching drills with uh, Spencer Zer and Jake Martinelli, the two younger guys on the – or lower guys on the QB roster. So they're making sure to get extra work in every day to make sure that that chemistry is there with all of our QBs, not just Jaden. Yeah, and you really do have a nice mix. Or you kind of mentioned this, but you have a nice mix of veterans and some younger guys on the O-line. Obviously, you've got guys like Trevor Griffin and Connor Smith who are kind of the, the old guys, so to speak, and then you mentioned a couple of the younger guys. What is it like to kind of have that mixture to be able to just learn from those older guys and then obviously have younger guys that are good enough to go in there and just soak it up and 
use it right away. Well, I think the big change that's hit the South Dakota Mines football team as of lately is when I first got here, we had guys like Ola and Jack Batho, where it's those are those fifth, sixth year guys that you really look up to. But at the same time, they don't spend as much time on you, developing you as much. And obviously, the offensive line coaches, they have to focus on the guys that are going to play this year. So in your first year, you don't get that much of attention and people focusing on what you need to work on. It's kind of on you to get that progression started. Whereas this year, while Connor is, yeah, he's one of the old guys. Kobe's one of the old guys. Griff is a now third-year veteran of starting. It doesn't feel like that in our room where every single day it's those old guys are talking to the young guys just as much as they're talking to anyone else. And we all kind of work together to make sure that everyone is progressing rather than just the guys who have a chance of playing. The redshirt freshmen are coming along just as quickly as we need them to to be prepared for spring ball next season where they have a chance of playing. And it makes me have a lot more confidence in the progression of our team. And I believe I'm seeing that a lot in other rooms, the wide receiver room, JB's doing an amazing job with that. The running back room, Orlando is constantly getting the younger guys ready. So I feel like we have a lot more depth to our team rather than the initial starting 11. Yeah, yeah, I would agree with that. And I think you can see it every week. You know, you see guys like Ty Harris, Mason Galbraith, you know, who got, who got obviously Ty's a true freshman, but Mason didn't get a lot, ton of run last year. And now he's coming on and making a difference. Even Jake Leone, I know he played a lot last year. But he wasn't the guy who was going to go grab four or five balls in a game. Now he's out there running routes and spreading it around. And just a lot more guys are making plays and that's, instead of the main core. Exactly. And that's kind of what JB wanted to emphasize over the summer is, like, everybody needs to be ready for any moment in this game. Ball's coming to you. The block is coming to you. You need to be able to do your job. And Jake Leone really took that to heart because he's been in almost every day doing the wide receiver drills, making sure that when that ball comes his way, he's ready to catch it. He knows what he's going to do after, make a move, make someone miss, get the yards that we need. And Mason Galbraith, he's a tall guy. I want to say he's 6'4"-ish. He's up there, which is the opposite of JB and Zay, where they're those quick, shifty guys. So there's going to be different balls thrown to each of them, but Mason's really assumed his role of, I'm going to go up there and jump over this guy and get that ball. And I just love to see that instead of only having two quote unquote options for the quarterback to throw to, now we have young guys like Jack McFarland getting in there where it's every single wide receiver, every single tight end on our roster is a weapon that's ready to go and make five, six yards of play. Yeah, for sure. Uh, just jumping back a little bit, let's start, I guess, focusing on your <laughs> journey, so to speak. You grew up in Aurora, right? Yes, sir, Aurora, Colorado. A lot of the guys on the team are from Aurora, it seems like. Did you have any connections with any of those guys before you got here? So a big thing about Aurora is it's a highly populated area. And quite frankly, I've never heard of South Dakota Mines until my senior year of football. And my offensive line coach said, hey, uh, I want you to go up there and see what it's like up there. They're an RMAC school. They play against Pueblo, Colorado Mines, teams that are familiar to me. So I want you to go up there and see what it's like. And I was just excited to get a chance, an opportunity to go somewhere. So I went up to visit Rapid City with my father. I remember we got into the hotel room. There was a little packet, Dante Robbins, offensive lineman, because I played left tackle my entire life. So I get in there. I'm all excited. I meet Coach O'Neill, who was the offensive line coach at the time. Shook hands with him, took a couple photos, and then he put me on the scale. And I'm sitting there with quarters in my pockets, thick jeans, a belt, everything. I look at the scale, and it says 235. And he says, oh, uh, we're, we're going to have you go talk to Coach Bo and Coach Winters on the defensive side of the ball. <laughs> I was like, all right. So I go sit down with Coach Winters, and he asked me uh, what he viewed to be important questions, and to this day I still remember them. It was, what is your favorite football moment? I went on to tell him this story about a comeback win that we had in high school and just the joy that I felt there. And then he asked about uh, my most inspirational win, which was beating our rival, and then our worst loss, which was our playoff loss against what ended up being uh, an old tight end here, Jack Kelly's playoff win. And he, I think he had me in there for a good 45 minutes just telling these stories 
and he and I were just laughing along. And eventually he ended up offering me to play defensive line because he liked my attitude and how I approached football, and he thought that I would be a benefit to the team. And I remember going on my visit, I saw a familiar face. It was Keontae Christian. I saw him, and I was like, he looks so familiar. And I asked uh, my uh, guy who I was on the visit with, I looked at Cole Jesh, and I said, hey, where is he from? He said, Eagle Crest, Aurora, Colorado. I was like, ah, dang. I remember playing against him. I remember I was down at left tackle, and he looks at me, and he goes, they're pulling on this play. And I was like, damn, how did he know that? How did he know that? It was my sophomore year, his senior year. And it made me smile thinking that there are a lot of ACO kids here, people who came from where I came from. And it made Rapid City feel a lot more like home. For sure, that's a pretty funny story, especially <laughs> Keontae. So he was a stud even back then, being able oh, to yeah. diagnose, you know. He was a film monster. Yeah. Um, so early on in your life, like growing up, did you play other sports other than football, or were you kind of always a football guy? So that's that's a funny story, too. My father, when I was four or five years old, he watched me run around, and my dad played football, defensive, offensive line, big guy. And he watched me run around when I was little. And he was like, yeah, you're not playing football now. I was like, Dad, let me play, let me play. He was, you're not coordinated. We're going to start you with soccer. <laughs> we got to get your feet right before you go playing football, get yourself killed. So I'm playing soccer, and I got this big afro. And I was doing really good for my first year, year and a half. And then my dad started realizing, like, why is he getting slower? Like, why isn't he playing as well as he used to? And he realized my hair was covering my face and I couldn't see the ball. So I would have to flip my hair up with my hands. And I was like a half step behind everyone else now. And he was like, that's it. You're cutting your hair. Shaves it. Next day, I'm back to playing really well. We go from soccer to baseball. Played first base. It was always a fun time. And then around sixth or seventh grade, he finally let me start playing football. And immediately, I was the second fastest kid on the team. Dad didn't care. He said, you're playing offensive line. You're going to get bigger, going to get taller. You're playing O-line. So I started there, uh, got into my freshman year of high school. So I've only played for two years. Uh, started on our freshman team. Sophomore year, end up starting for varsity. And from there, got a couple accolades where CTs, Offensive Lineman of the Year, just smaller stuff like that. Made me happy at the time, but always gave me something more to work for because we were in a competitive conference. We had Cherokee, or we were Cherokee Trail. We were up against Eagle Crest, Cherry Creek, Grandview, bigger schools in Aurora where those are teams that are going for state. They have offensive linemen who are going D1, uh, a whole bunch of big things like that. And I always thought those are the guys I want to compete against. I want to get an all-state honors over them, things like that. Uh, I think the most I ever ended up getting was a, I got first team all-conference my senior year, which felt pretty good, but yeah. still a lot more to work for. For sure. And then uh, when did you kind of start realizing that, I guess, college football was maybe in your future or something you wanted to pursue? Well, my father always told me football is a luxury. It comes to an end at some point but your education is what really matters. So you're not gonna go play football at a D3 school. You're not gonna go play football where you have to pay money, a significant amount of money to play. The only time you're gonna play football is if one, you're getting paid to do it, and two, if you're getting a good education alongside it. So when I came up, I think it was the year before I started coming, or I got offered for South Dakota Mines I started going to uh, six zero, which was a recruiting option. You would go in there two to three times a week. You would watch film on the team that you're going to play against this week, and then he would help you. Matt McChesney would help you out with offensive line drills, D line drills, whatever position you played. He would help you get out there and then get recruited for it. And ultimately, it was about my junior year that I started going there, and that's when I realized I really wanted to continue playing college football and get to work on that. And then luckily enough, uh, Coach O'Neill found me, Coach Winters took a chance on me, and here I am. 
Yeah, and you kind of already mentioned this, but you, initially you kind of got recruited as an O-line, <laughs> switched to D-line, and now you're back as an O-line. So what was that kind of process and transition like? Well, as an offensive lineman, I was always one of the bigger guys on the team. So when I first got up here for my first couple of days, it was COVID, so we didn't have fall camp. But once we decided we were playing a season, I go out there day one. Coach Bo is running us. He's freshman over here. You guys are going to push the sled. You're going to shed off, hit the drill, or hit the bag. Go, 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 go. And by the end of the first day, I'm, <sighs> I'm breathing so heavy, and I've never breathed this heavy on the offensive line because it's just power work over there. Here it's quick, get off, go run, chase down the ball. So I'm breathing hard, but I'm like, okay, I could do this. Every day I'm talking to Keontae, Mike Retland, Zizo, the older guys on the defensive line, like, hey, I've never done this before, but I need y'all to make sure that I'm getting right. You guys, like, whatever pointers you have, let me hear them. I want to be the best defensive lineman I could be. So I trained that for a good three, four weeks, I believe. <coughs> and then uh, COVID really started running through the team. And at that point, I believe we were going over to play Shadron, and we had seven offensive linemen. That includes Trevor Griffin, Grant Bremer, all of these guys, seven. Actually, I remember it was Mesa because we were traveling that week. And all of these guys are down with COVID, and we're still practicing throughout the week, getting a good 40, 50 reps of practice. But now it's just the starting five there getting every single rep. I go to Coach Bo, I believe it was on Tuesday. I was like, hey, Coach, I know a lot of the O-line guys are down. I used to play O-line, so if you want to send me over there, I'm cool with that. I kind of said it as a joke at first. And Coach Bo was, ah, yeah, whatever, Dante. <clears throat> then we go through another practice. I'm looking at these offensive linemen just sweating, dying over there because they're taking every rep. And this time after practice, I go up to Coach Bo a little more serious. I'm like, hey, Coach. I did play offensive linemen. I don't want to hype myself up too much. I know it's college ball, but I was a pretty decent offensive lineman in Aurora, Colorado, which is in a small area. Like I played against people. I could do offensive line. He's like, you know what, Dante? I'll talk to Coach O'Neill. Next day, he comes up to me before practice. He said, hey, go over there. And I, Ever since then, I've never looked back. Yeah. Got the knee braces, got the shoulder braces, got set up for offensive line, and I've been loving it ever since. Yeah, and I mean, obviously, it's more natural for you to play at O line in high school. It's a pretty big, you know, pe people outside of football probably don't understand. It's a big difference to play O line compared to D line. Oh, yeah. Just the technique, the footwork, everything. And it felt weird to go over to D line, be able to go into a four point stance, both my hands down. But going back, it felt natural. It was perfect. I just sat back into my stance, going to my pass set. Everything felt like I was back to where I belonged. For sure. And then uh, just talking a little bit about some of the other stuff you're involved in. You remember the Hard Rocker Ally Association? Of course. That's a pretty big thing here on campus and obviously in the community. You guys do a lot of great work. What has it been like to be able to be a part of that and see the growth of that? Well, when we first started, I remember it was – Myself, Jake Martinelli, Mike Retland, uh, Prince, Keontae, and there were a couple other people in there, but that's just going off the top of my head. And we had kind of talked about the kneeling and the national anthem and everything like that, and that's where it kind of started picking up. And we got a lot of attention for that, where it was over Facebook, people were reaching out. Some people were saying not too nice things, but other people were reaching out and we were responding with, let's have a conversation. Like, we want to hear your perspective. We want you to hear our perspective. And then maybe we could find some middle ground in there. And unfortunately, we couldn't do that with some of the alumni. Um, to this day, we are still open to talking to anyone and everyone about different opinions on things. But the main one that stood out to us was, I want to say, Tim Duncan. He works at the Rapid City Police Department. And he's higher up there in the police department. And he said, hey, I would love to listen to whatever conversation you guys are about to have. And we got in touch with him. And Mike eventually threw the first Hard Rocker Ally Association meeting, which was the black experience with Mike. 
and it was kind of Mike would go up there and tell his experience with one being black growing up in Aurora, Colorado. I believe he lives a good 15 minutes down the road from me, so really close. And he and I still talk to this day, and he talked about his experience with police, everything about growing up in Aurora, other situations that have happened in Aurora. And it all hit really close to home for me, and not just because it hit home, close to home for me, but it hit close to home as me being a biracial man. And I felt related to a lot of the subjects that he was talking about, and I felt inspired to help take this association to the next level. So from there, we just kept working at it. And we had many successful meetings in regards to not just the black experience, but also how women in STEM feel here on campus. Obviously, South Dakota Mines is a male dominant college, but they're also a minority that deserve to be recognized. And the Hard Rocker Ally Association really just wants to focus on making sure that everyone here at South Dakota Mines feels both recognized and accepted. And that's a huge thing. And I feel like Keontae, Josie Stevens, Jake Martinelli, and I have all done a good job in conserving Mike's wish of keeping this program alive. Yeah, and it's not really just South Dakota Mines, right, though? It's the community, too. You really yeah. have done a great job of having some of those conversations with if we're if we're being honest we're in a pretty there's not a lot of yeah without being you know there's not a lot of diversity diversity in this area so a lot of people you know maybe don't understand what you know you mentioned the black experience with mike a lot of people from around here probably don't understand that and it's not just from around here it's a lot of people that come to this school from small town South Dakota, small town Wyoming, Iowa, Montana, all of those areas, it's very different than inner city Denver, Atlanta, California. There's a lot of different experiences and our goal is kind of to help them understand our perspective of where we come from and our experience with different things. But at the same time, we want to understand their experience of growing up in small town South Dakota, where you know every police officer in town, and just the different perspective that it takes. And at the end of the day, we're all just very curious people, and we want to have a better understanding of how not just our community in Rapid City, but the state and our country, how there's different perspectives. And that's kind of the goal that we've been working towards. And I'm also a part of the SAC program, the Student Athlete Advisory Committee. And I was lucky enough to be able to go to a conference in California last semester in the spring with Jake Martinelli and Bailey Johnson. And I had kind of raised that at this conference that, hey, the Hard Rocker Ally Association is something we started in South Dakota. I know there are a lot of other D2s here that are in smaller towns. Oregon, Wyoming, those types of areas where it's just, I know you guys are from those areas and I'd love to hear your perspective, but I would also like for you guys to be able to start a similar program at your colleges. Sure. And our goal is kind of, we've made a very big impact here in Rapid City and we hope to expand that impact to other division twos across the country. Yeah. And then what, maybe you don't have a plan yet. I know you got a couple of years left. But what ideally, I assume you want to also be able to bring it back to Aurora eventually or wherever yep. you wind up after you're done here. What are some of the things you'd like to be able to do either back home or wherever you wind up? Well, a big thing that I've wanted to do and I've succeeded in doing here is establishing a connection with the police department. And kind of going through that, we've been able to open up a lot of more doors with volunteering and just working in the community. And a big part of that is I want to be able to take what we've done here, working with an accredited police department and taking that to Aurora and other neighborhoods where it's not so nice with the police and having those conversations and start moving the community towards better trust with the police. Because where I'm from, there's not that trust and loving nature. It feels a lot more hostile. And that partially comes from actions done by the, the police departments, but that also comes from by the community and their distrust in the police. So if we can work from both ends and get the community to start trusting police officers more and just having a lot more interaction with one another, I think that would lead to some pretty big changes in my neighborhood. For 
for sure. And uh, I know uh, the Ally Association does a couple like meetups in community every year. I know you did a couple last year. Do you have something scheduled right now, or when's the next time a community member could come and you know hear your guys' story, so to speak? We haven't scheduled another experience like we did with Mike. Uh, we're kind of looking to our president right now, Keontae, for that. And we're wondering what steps we want to take. Because at some point, just talking about our experience isn't doing enough. And we really want to, this last year, we've been focusing a lot more on our community outreach and really working with kids in the neighborhood. So we've been offering tutoring to kids in the neighborhood that any Minds kid can sign up for. We also offer cooking classes with uh, some struggling kids in the area where Minds kids can also learn for themselves how to cook instead of just eating ramen in the dorms. Sure, yeah, that's awesome. You know, I'm, I love talking about the Ally Association with, association with as many people as I can because I just think it's such a great message and such a great thing you guys are trying to do so i appreciate what you guys do with it for sure and we appreciate you talking about it because that's really how we get around is word of mouth just people that was our goal is that we want to be known as the friendly accepting group on campus and we want people to take pride in having a group like this where our campus isn't just white males here we have a lot of diversity in these people that feel that they're more diverse they feel accepted here at mines and we love that everyone is coming together over this all right switching gears again a little Let's bit i it. guess here um kind of more to the academic side you're a business management major right? yep. correct do you have any idea what you want to do with that going forward have you done any internships or anything yet uh, my first year here, I just wanted to stay in South Dakota, work on learning the playbook a lot more. So I took an internship up at the Core Wharf Mine. And I know Jake Martinelli also took one in the metallurgical lab there. And he and I just spent every day last or my freshman year summer working and studying the playbook and just making a bond with each other. And it was a very beneficial situation, but it also made me realize I do miss home. And I can't wait to go back. So my sophomore year summer, I took a internship at the Adams County District Attorney's Office. And while working there, I really refound my love for law. So after I complete my business degree, I will be applying to law school. I started studying for my LSATs. So that's the route that it's going to take me. What are you thinking excited. in law? Are you thinking attorney? Are you thinking not sure yet? Well, at first I was thinking attorney. My father named me Dante Ariel Robbins, D.A. Robbins. So he always wanted me to be a district attorney. But I've, I really want to experience everything that law has to offer before I make a concrete decision. So as of last summer, I worked with trial attorneys and the district attorney's office, kind of seeing that side of criminal law. And this next summer, I'm looking to get a law internship with a private firm that will be working more towards contract and tort law. And I just, before I go to law school, I want to get a lot of the experiences so that way I could start focusing on the specific subset. Yeah, you probably don't want to get into law school and then <laughs> not, not sure what you want to do yet. Exactly. Um, then, obviously, you're a very busy guy. Everyone here is. The academics here are just it, they're a lot. Yeah. I, I personally could never do what you guys do here. Um, how do you kind of balance that, you know, with some of the community service stuff you do with football? And then do you have any, if you have any downtime, what do you kind of like to do? as a hobby um quite frankly the business management major isn't the most difficult major here we have on campus obviously there are guys like jake martinelli who's in chemical engineering jared meyer who's in electrical engineering and even like trevor griffin with mechanical who's viewed to be one of the easier majors like those guys have a lot of work to do and as a business major I don't have as much, but it is still difficult to get through at times. And the biggest thing that I have is just motivation gets you in the door. 
everyone is going to have motivation at the beginning of the semester doing it like that but dedication is what helps you finish through and my biggest problem is just continuing to work on it and there are, there are going to be days where I'm sitting there and I don't want to do this homework let's watch film for three hours and it's just a want to factor of I just really need to lock in on this go into the library I'm so happy it's 24 7 so just go in there grind out homework for a little bit and my free time football <laughs> I spend all of my time doing football yeah. whether it be watching film that we've already had or just playing Madden like I'll play Madden every now and then with Orlando sure. so sure. video game guy or just Madden I'll, I'll play a couple of games here and there, but lately it's just been Madden. We got a nice little scoreboard over at the house. Sure. Sure. And just kind of wrapping up here, um, what would your advice be for somebody maybe interested in coming to the school yet but hasn't visited or doesn't know as much? My advice would be to come with a smile on your face, keep your chin up. Just when you get here, there are going to be some people that don't want to talk as much. There's going to be people that are going to want to talk all day. And college is one of those experiences where you bring people from all different types of ways of life. You bring people from the city. You bring people from the country. And South Dakota Mines is really turning into that kind of boiling pot where you have international students. You have people from Denver. You have people from Bennett, Wyoming, like all over the place. And it's really nice to see all of these different cultures coming together. Just stay on top of your academics and enjoy the ride. And then for you personally, obviously, I know you probably still have two years left, right? Or just, just about. Just, okay. um, what do you, when you graduate from here, what do you want people to, what do you want your legacy to be at South Dakota Mines? Quite frankly, I understand my role. I'm an offensive lineman through and through. I don't expect people to know my name off the top of their head, but I it's expect usually them. better if they don't, right? <laughs> exactly. I expect them and every football player that comes through here to look back at this season, the 2022-2023 season, as that was the turning point for South Dakota Mines football. This is the point where we really etched our culture in as a winning culture rather than what feels like in the last couple of years has been a losing culture. And I think this is going to be the turning point for our football program as well as our athletics program into a much tighter dedication towards winning. All right, Dante, I don't think I have anything else for you. Thanks for joining me today. Thank you. Good luck this week. Good luck the rest <laughs> of the season. Um, this has been Josh Van valkenberg Gernert signing off. Thank you for listening to The Hard Rocker Huddle with host Josh Van Volkenberg-Gernert. Follow on Apple and Spotify. <laughs>